Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builders Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Baldwin 5704. This is a rim lock. This is a very, very unusual uh, lock to sell, at least it is for me nowadays, um, because this type of lock, this, this construction of lock, goes back to the 17th century, probably, if not the 18th century. I'd, I'd have to refresh my memory. But doing new installations today of this type of rim lock, which is of a warded type construction, is extremely unusual. Um, I don't know that in 30 years of selling hardware, I've sold more than three of these. Uh, so it's very unusual, and it was definitely before the age of YouTube is the last time that I sold one. Um, now, I want to make a video about this uh, lock, which is right here. That's at least the lock body. This is what's called a rim lock. It is definitely founded on technology that is several hundreds of years old and would be absolutely considered low security, absolutely low security, by certainly by today's standards. Um, and actually, in the period of time, it was probably considered low security by those who could easily manipulate this lock um, and others of its ilk of that time. So starting out this video, others who could manipulate this lock, I want to start out with that, a little bit of history. Um, and while someone with more knowledge and expertise and experience than I could go on at length, um, I will, I will, I'll give you some, some, you know, context of what this lock is. So this technology is is certainly um, 18th century technology. Um, this lock is what is called a warded lock. Warded locks basically are the predecessor to lever tumbler locks. Lever tumbler locks are the predecessors to pin tumbler locks. And pin tumbler locks are the predecessors to, um, it, it, at least in the United States, um, the predecessor to high security variants and derivatives of the pin tumbler concept and actually the tumbler concept. So the tumbler is. Tumbler is the word that's used, which is the item that is the blockage inside of the lock. You can't get the lock open because it's blocked. There's a blockage. The tumbler is the blockage, whether, whether it be a pin tumbler, which is our modern construction, even though that construction is 170 years old, and the concept is 4,000 years old. You can have lever tumblers, which are the predecessor to pin tumblers. It was the standard technology in 18, you know, during the Civil War, well, actually, we have to go before that because uh, you had pin tumbler and lever, lever tumbler at that time. You know, when Thomas Jefferson was alive, it was lever tumblers is what it was. Um, and then there's disc tumblers, and disc tumblers are used in low security applications like cam locks. So this, pre, this technology predates all of that. And um, it's absolutely remarkable, the history of the evolution of the lock in both uh, the brilliance of the people who came up concocted these ideas, number one. Number two, could leverage manufacturing time, manufacturing capabilities of their day to, 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 to bring the locks to life. Um, and, and it's also interesting how the lock has not, I, I would say, not developed beyond the original concept of the blockage. Okay. If you've got, the, the role of the key is to remove the blockage. That's what the key does, directly or indirectly. And there is a staggering amount of variety when it comes to the platform and the technology of a cylinder and how the key removes the blockage. Literally staggering. This lock, by today's standards, would be thoroughly simple to bypass. Re ridiculously simple to bypass. I am not a locksmith, um, even though I you know, um, have a designation. I don't work all day in the locksmithing trade. Um, but anyone with some knowledge would find this painfully easy to, uh, even I could do it. <laughs> and I don't have any special skill in it. So what's happened over the centuries is that the evolution of the lock has come just after finding out about a means by which it could be bypassed. Okay. And that leapfrog has continued on for the centuries and decades to where cylinder technology stands today with several with us with scores 
with a, with a couple of score of manufacturers who continue to leapfrog each other with patents and new technologies and new derivatives. And what that's all geared towards is the preservation of a key system, making them more capable of creating uh, theoretical bidding numbers, a larger system, making them, them more pick re resistant, more impression resistant, uh, really locking down the key itself, patenting the key so that it cannot be legally duplicated or, or the key manufactured by another, um, by a, a manufacturer other than who's patented it, but also controlling access to the key. You can have the high security lock, but if you don't have the key, you're probably not going to get much use out of the lock. Well, this warded lock is operated by, when I said blockage, um, it's a ward, it's a block, it's a ward in the sense that the term ward means you have to do something t so that the bolt can operate around the fact that there's a ward. This is a warded lock, meaning that the key will remove the blockage to bypass the ward so that the bolt can operate. This is a funny lock, though, in that it is a hybrid of 18th century technology. Well, it's a hybrid of a warded lock with modern pin tumbler technology. Now the pin tumbler cylinder is a is an Egyptian concept from 4,000 years ago. Linus Yale Jr., who has nothing to do with Baldwin, has everything to do with the with Yale, which we probably have all heard of Yale. He patented the pin tumbler cylinder, which is this happens to be a rim cylinder, um, uh, but it's a pin tumbler cylinder. So the blockage in there are the pin tumblers, and when you insert the key and it has the correct cuts on the key, those pins will come to a shear line, removing the blockage, allowing it to turn. Well, this warded lock does the same thing in that when you insert the key, it will, it will allow the key to bypass the blockage, is what it does. A little bit of history in terms of why this lock is so important um, and justifying the date. There, this is a reprint. This is a book that I bought from an online book cylinder. It was a library book, in fact. Um, and I, in the year of publication of this reprint, who knows? Can't be very old. Copyright date of this reprint is 1970. Okay, this is 1970. This book was first published in 1868. This is written by A.C. Hobbs. Um, forgive me, Lucasfilm, but A.C. Hobbs to me was the Han Solo of his age because he was admired. He was, um, I imagine him to be a man who, who spoke little, although I doubt that he was, probably spoke little, but he spoke volumes by what he did not say. And he was basic. He was born when um, Madison was president. He was an inventor, a lock maker, worked for lock companies. The bottom line is, in England, you had your Chubb and other companies that made likely a king's ransom of money when it came to came to supplying locks for the banking industry. As time evolved, and people became more became wealthier, you know, the two classes of, of you know, of folks in, uh, in, in Europe and in England, you, the wealthy collected or amassed valuables. Well, now we need locks to lock up our valuables. When no one had valuables, there weren't too many locks. And actually, for centuries prior to this time, mid-19th century, um, there weren't too many locks, and anyone who had a lock was a pretty, pretty important person. Uh, so A.C. Hobbs was an inventor, worked for, he was a uh, lock maker, he worked for lock companies, he sold locks, he was a salesman. He was a traveling salesman, too. Well, there was a, the Great Expo Exposition in England in 1851, and Chubb and the other companies basically put a reward for anyone who could show up and pick their lock. Well... Um, there's only one guy who could do the Kessel Run, and there was only one guy who could pick those locks. So A.C. Hobbs, and I would encourage you to read if you'll just find the passage uh, that I'm about to just talk about. He shows up, says, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. They're, they allow him, I think it was 24 hours, any tools you want to use, and within just 
a few minutes, not five, I don't recall, it may have been an hour, but it was not very long, he had that lock open. The lock that was known to be the securest lock, period, at that time. Well, A.C. Hobbs wrote this book called Construction of Locks and Safes, and I, I refer to this because in this book, we are going to absolutely see technology Let's pull that up. And the year cited to this type of lock is, you know, the first half of the 18th century, 17, you know, 30 or so. And this lock that we see here on that page is basically what we're looking at in the sense that there is a lever here that gets lifted when you insert the right key and it allows the bolt to pass. And as soon as you lift that blockage out of the way over the ward, the bolt will pass. This, I, I, I have read, uh, you cannot see it. I have a stack of books behind me that's about four and a half foot tall that I've read studying the world of locksmithing. And the warded lock was, was your typical lock back then. Um, and that's what this is. I don't see them very often because I'm not in extremely historic homes in New England, primarily, I would think. Um, although I did tour the Vanderbilt estate in outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and this home is full of rim locks. There must be, I don't know, I don't know how many north of 100 there are, but every door has a rim lock. And interesting... I don't recall if the exterior door was a keyed lock, but Mr. Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt's bedroom was a keyed function. Every other door was just a passage function, it seemed. There was a one locked, uh, one, one keyed version of this uh, warded lock in his, in the entire place. Those may have been lever tumbler locks. I don't know if they were truly warded. I wouldn't have known because from the outside, quite frankly, they look the same. So why someone would be ordering this lock, they are either hearkening back to a time long forgotten, uh, or they have a home that was built in the second half of the 19th century, and they want to keep it looking the same. You, I have had clients email me photographs of homes just recently uh, in New England, and they have rim locks installed. And you can still buy rim locks, obviously, from uh, Baldwin et al., uh, but they're really uncommon. So let's do this. Let's do a visual tour of the lock, and then we'll talk about the specifics of it, et cetera. We've talked about the history of it. Um, and we'll, we'll get into where it's used, you know, how it's installed, things of that nature. And we'll start off by pulling the cover off and looking more at it. And yes, this is what many people would call a skeleton key. The proper term is a bit key. It's not called a skeleton key. If you call it a skeleton key, people in the business will know what you mean. But when you take a bit key and you skeletonize it, you change it to serve a different purpose, that's where the term skeleton key would come in, or bypass key. This is what's called a bit key. There are two types of keys that look like this. There's a bit key, which is this because it has a bit. Then there's a barrel key that looks just like this, except that it has a hollowed out point here that when you insert it into the lock, there would be a post that it would go around and guide the key this is a bit key, which will allow it actually to be used from either side of the door. And the fact that this lock includes a rim cylinder for the outside, you don't have to have that. You don't have to use that rim cylinder, but you will have to prep a hole for your bit key to go through. Um, and you'll note that the shank of this is probably going to be long enough to fit an average thickness door. So let's take a closer look. Let's dig into the construction of this lock because it's quite fascinating and can be and can reading the history of locks be I suppose a little bit dull uh, I suppose but what keeps you going is just tapping into the mind of the sheer brilliance of the of the people who thought up these ideas there are locks um, and I'll just before I break this there is the uh, there is a the mechanic society in New York in Manhattan they are a group of like-minded individuals that are in a particular, within a particular in industry, engineering, manufacturing, things of that nature. Well, in the Mechanic Society, who um, are some of the f 
most gracious people I've ever met. They allowed me to come visit the museum when it was closed, opened the doors just for me, let me come in, and all they ask is a tiny, they, they ask for a donation, and it's tiny, the suggested donation. If you go, double what they ask, just because on the second floor there's a lock collection, and there are locks there that there are only this many that exist, you know, and they're probably not in North America. Uh, so if you really want to dive deep and you're in Manhattan, absolutely go. It's the best 10 or 20 or $50, whatever you want to donate, that you will possibly spend in Manhattan if you want to look at these locks up uh, front and close. Let's pause this. Let's come back in a moment. Now we're going to continue on and take a closer look at the mechanism on the inside of the lock body itself. Um, if you're ordering these, and, and the reason that I have this lock in the first place, I didn't order it for my collection even though, um, you know, if I was looking for warded locks, I would probably just buy something just antique rather than a modern version of it. But the reason that I have this lock is because of the lead time a client ordered this lock in maybe May of 2020. And of course, regardless of when you're watching this video, you will probably have quite first-hand knowledge of what happened in 2020. Well, many things stopped. Uh, and this order may have been placed in April, uh, actually. I don't recall. It doesn't matter. But fairly close after the pandemic was really getting traction um, countrywide. Um, and the client was like, hey, it's six weeks. Yeah, no, these are normally 10 weeks. Okay, that's fine. Well, 10 turned into 15, turned into 20. And at that point, the guy was like, cancel it. C cancel it. I'm not, I don't care. So um, I have a lock collection. And uh, while this may not be joining my lock collection, this will just be put on the shelf to be sold. Some, someone someday is going to call and say, do you have one of these on the shelf? And I'll say, yes, I do. Uh, and that's generally how it works out. But the fact of the matter is I have this because of the lead time, so be mindful. In a non-pandemic year, this takes weeks and weeks to get. Uh, please be sure that you are comfortable with the lead time because no one stocks these because it's not 1820, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna remove the rear cover, which I already have a couple of screws removed anyway, and we're gonna get in there. Now, one interesting thing is it has this quick little uh, bolt unbolt from the inside so quick and fast you don't need the key that's not a feature that I'm accustomed to seeing on older technology uh, on, on that technology uh, warded locks now remember when I pull the cover off the entire concept is blockage there's a blockage that just has to get moved and that's what the key does so there are photographs down below of this I'm not scared about putting it back together, but I don't want the parts to fall out needlessly. I don't think it'll fall. You want to um, maybe pause the video so you can study the parts. I find that when I'm doing work, I need to be able to study the, the parts and get an idea of, the, of how they operate. Well, the entire business end of this, well, it's obviously the bolt, of course. That would be the business end. Is right here. That little lobe is what prevents the bolt from being thrown and being retracted. This little lobe, well, maybe not a lobe, but this little feature right here. What that feature is doing is I'm going to remove one more part because I do want to illustrate how these locks work. And they're very simple locks. This is the this is the lever tumbler. If there if there were to be one, 
this would be the item that you need to this is the item that the key interacts to move the blockage so I'm going to place this on its side and now we've got some parts exposed so this little gizmo here sets right in to that area right there at the tip of my screwdriver and sits in that crotch so that you can't push the bolt back until you insert the key you move that lever getting that moved up to where you can then operate the lock and because it's spring biased it will then fit down well it won't go that far but it will then fit down there so that you can't throw the lock out now you probably wouldn't care about throwing the lock out but you still want the lock in the restricted blocked position because you know what's interesting about that there were locks once upon a time that didn't have that and um, I've never read this story, but I could see it happening. You've got a farmhouse with one of these locks, if you had a lock at all, and in your front yard is a set of train tracks. And now that scenario I've actually been to. Um, the vibration itself will cause that bolt to come out. And while that's a fictional story, I've never read that, but that's how that would happen. Now what's a real story is ships at sea, they're locks, their dials, their safes, their safe locks that have three wheels or four wheel packs, a million potential theoretical combinations. Because the wheels have a have a gate in them, they're heavier at the bottom of the wheel than they are at the top. So all of those gates over time, because of the movement of the boat, will line up, allowing the fence to enter and get that open. So that's why it's like that. So I'm going to put this back together here. Just kindly give me a moment. Okay, beautiful. Just going to put that screw back in. And when I work on these locks, I like to have a cloth. I'd like to keep that oil down as much as possible. And I don't know what the lubricant that Baldwin uses, but I will tell you that if you're going to service these locks, which I would encourage you to do, they're not difficult locks, um, find out what they use and use only that, because that's the way it was engineered. Okay. So we've got that put back together. So the bolt won't the bolt won't come out because it's blocked. But when I put that key in and I make that move, it allows the bolt head in this lobe to move free of the path of the bolt itself. The bolt is not only the bolt head, but it's in the entire plate below. That's what's moving, and that's what inherently makes this a warded lock. Now, that entire bolt moves. The older versions, and if you were to study them, is nothing other than a bird's mouth cut in the bottom of the bolt. There is a spring-biased gizmo that's like this. That in the bird's mouth is here and the bolt is here. It prevents it from moving until such a point where you hit it back here. It forces it to drop and then the bolt can move back and forth. There would be two bird's mouth preps actually in the bolt. One in the locked position and the other in the unlocked position so that you would be able to, um, well, actually, I'm doing it wrong. So bird's mouth prep here, bird's mouth prep here. I'm locked in, hit the key, bolt goes out, I'm locked back in. And this is doing the same thing, just in a way that I've never seen before in any lock book that I've ever, any catalog that I've ever looked at. Now, how does the key work? Well, I've already demonstrated it, but let's just take a look at it. So the key would enter in, well, let's put it in from the from this side, very gingerly. The key's going to enter in, okay, 
and it's going to rotate and you can see how it moves it. I'm very hesitant to move it any further because I don't want the parts to move out on me. Okay. And that bit is what's driving all of that. The bit is what's driving it. Now, there are a couple of ward cuts on this key. That and that are ward cuts, but there are no case wards in this. Now, a case ward would be, I can show it to you in the book. Oh, here, right to the page. These are case wards. And they would be on the bottom of the case, and therefore your key would have to be cut in the edge right there and right there to get around the case ward. But it's all a case ward, and it's star-shaped, or whatever you might call that. And that is the ward that's in the key. So you don't... These are just simple ward cuts, but you don't need them. You just need a, a bit, a rectangular bit. This whole piece here is the bit. They probably put them there just so it looks like a bit key, but they're not needed at all because there are no wards in this lock at all. So when I say that this is low security, I mean if I were to have a paper clip and, you know, if I were to have any instrument that could get and affect change on my lever, I'm going to be able to pull the lock in and out, okay, without without any trouble. And I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll resist the temptation of demonstrating that on camera. Um, there's no need to. Just sticking something in there and making it move. Um, and that's how that is. So I'm going to put this back together. And then we'll talk about how you can use this from either side of the door. And indeed, of course, that's how it was. You would not have... Um, a pin tumbler or rim cylinder on the outside, um, you would obviously need to be able to get in. So getting in requires a hole to be cut through the door, which is a disadvantage, no doubt. And um, it's a disadvantage because it's an access point. The fact of the matter is every lock manufacturer will tell you if there's a keyway, there's a way to bypass that. doesn't necessarily have to be the key, and I'm, I've heard it from the mouth of the preeminent high security cylinder manufacturer in North America. If there's a keyway, there's a way to bypass it. With enough time, with enough time, you can do it. So from the inside, you're not going to need the key because they've got this handy 21st or 20th century adaptation. You're also going to have the knob that's going to retract that latch bolt every time. But you come home, it's 1820, you come home, you've got your bit key that goes through the door into the case goes through the door into the case, okay, out it comes, okay. Now, all you're doing here is locking and unlocking the bolt, throwing it and retracting it. You're still going to have the knob on the outside. So it's always a passage, except when it's locked from the outside or inside. So every time you come home, you're going to need to do that. Every time that you leave, you're going to need to do that in the morning. So that's how this lock operates. Now, when it comes to the function of warded and lever tumbler locks, there's lots of functions in the sense of how you turn the key and how the latch works separately from the bolt with the stop works. There are locks that, um, with a single, with a key, with a turn of the key, you can retract the latch and uh, the bolt, and you keep going. You retract the latch, and that um, that lock exists as well. I was taking the. Aloha, this is the CPL pin, the Certified Professional Locksmith. The bottom line is if you pass 15 tests, one large one and 14 relatively small ones, um, you, will, you will get this. One of the tests was a real bastard of a test, um, and it was on lever tumbler locks, things like this. And it, the final answer that I was able, the final question I needed to get correct, I found that answer in a 1937 Yale catalog, just to show you how old this technology is. But the bottom line is, if you're going to have the designation, it's all locksmithing. Uh, whether it be modern cylinder technology by any modern cylinder technology manufacturer, I, I could, you know, just in no particular order. Obviously, Medico, Asa, Schlage, Yale, Abloy. Corbin Russwin, uh, Sergeant, Scorpion, 
multi-lock, bi-lock, down the line. I've got books back there that are that thick, and that's just kind of North American stuff. Not all of it, but almost all of it is. You get into the European or outside of North America market, there's countless variants of high security locks. And in fact, in Europe and outside the United States, the keys that look like this are very common. Um, they're very common and they are very high security locks uh, in the sense that the key that you have on a safe deposit box is no different than this in its function and that the edge of the bit is what's moving the blockage out of the way. There could be cuts there, there will be a, a flat key that has these rectangular or square geometric notches in it. It's the same concept. You're moving something to allow that bolt to move back and forth. So protecting your valuables so valuable that you have them in a bank is technology from the 18th century. Pure and simple. Are they extremely highly secure? Absolutely. I can't speak as an expert uh, on those locks at all, but they're there for a reason, and that's because of the role that they play. So let's continue on with a uh, visual tour of the rest of the parts in this box. Now let's continue on with the tour of the material, but before we do that, let's take a, some dimensions of the lock case itself. About four and three quarter wide, about three and three quarter tall overall projection or, or thickness of the body, about 13 sixteenths. Why is this called a rim lock? Because it's installed on the rim of the door or the perimeter of the door on the outside edge, the rim of the door. Um, you know, you'd have a rim, you know, around a, a plate would be the rim, the rim of a record, you know, the outside part perimeter of the door. They're surface mounted right on the outside edge of the door. They're called rim locks. Rim locks are made in lots of varieties, you know, latching, bolting. Uh, when it's surface mounted and it's got some apparatus, some means to keep the door in the latched or bolted uh, position, secured or unsecured, is a rim lock. Uh, they're very typical, very common. Lots of people have made rim locks uh, in different varieties of very common rim lock that you'll find that's over 100 years old is the Siegel. If you got two round bolts that just drop down, that would be called a Siegel lock. Not the only company who makes those. It was a New York City detective that invented the Siegel lock about just after World War I, I think, or thereabouts, maybe in the 1920s. Um, that was a rim lock. It was mounted on the outside. You've got night latches, uh, a surface mounted rectangular body with a, um, a latch that when the door was slammed closed, it would latch automatically, um, a night latch. Uh, that's a rim lock mounted on the outside with or without a hold back feature. Um, all sorts of varieties of them in terms of mounted on the outside edge of the door, a rim lock, but then there's all these derivatives of how the bolting is occurring, latching, bolting, whatever the case might be. This is the latch. That's gonna automatically latch. That's the bolt, okay? Now, one other thing because it's not it's uh it's not on the template let's look at where these screw holes are if you might be replacing one which i would think that's probably why you're buying this center to center horizontal center to center looks like it's about three inch i'm going to hold the bot the body at 90 degrees a little bit easier to gauge that the horizontal center to center looks like it's about three and seven eighths. Maybe, yeah, three and seven eighths, right in that range. Okay. Now let's move to the next obvious thing. And this, by the way, the 190 in the part number means black. This is the knob that we have here. There are a pair of knobs. They are identical. There is nothing different about these two knobs. Um, so you can use one on either side, solid brass, very heavy, naturally as a result, give you some dimensional properties. Overall diameter, about an inch uh, and three quarter. The projection of the knob off of the face of, well, the rows that it's gonna install into, or the surface it will mount onto, that overall projection is right at about an inch and three quarter as well. Big piece of solid brass. 
Then you've got this other ring that's here. You've got two rings. They look the same. They're not the same. They are not even, they are used on the same side of the door though. The one with the larger hole is a really nice looking cylinder collar for the rim cylinder. Okay. If you're installing the rim cylinder on the outside, I can't imagine that you won't unless you want to go really 18th century and just drill a hole for this. Um, I don't know if Baldwin has any keyhole covers. I doubt it. I'm pretty sure you could find one on the online flea markets of the world if you wanted to really make it old school. So the other ring is here. Uh, this ring is meant for the, there are then two smaller discs. This one is threaded. It's got a couple of preparations in it for the, for the wrench that will be used. The other one does not. That is going to go in here. Your knob will go here. This is what's going to be mounted on the inside. Uh, pardon me. Sorry. This is what's mounted on the inside face of the door. This is for the outside. The inside face of the door. That will go in. The spindle will go through the door. The set screw will be set. And this is what you're going to see here. Okay. And I'm, I don't want, I'm not making the parts touch because I don't want them to, um, you know, this is a brand new lock. Okay. Let's take a look and see what the outside looks like now. Now let's take a look at what would appear to be on the outside. So that rose that I just mentioned is going to go on the outside. This threaded disc is going to go uh, on the outside as well, like that. Those two little preparations there are for the wrench that you're going to use to get that to tighten that threaded insert down onto the mounting plate. So on the outside you're going to have your rim cylinder, assuming you're putting that there. I can't imagine that you won't. It's going to go right here, that rim cylinder, that tail piece. Right underneath, vertically underneath the knob. Above that, you're going to mount this plate. You'll surface mount this plate according to the installation instructions, which we're going to look at in a moment. The, on the inside, the spindle is attached to the knob. The set screw is basically set. That gets pushed through the inside to the outside. This is sticking out. You're going to need to have your outside rows, the threaded doodad, sit inside the rows. The plate has to be on the door. That all comes down. The plate is there. You then thread that down onto the unit, then tighten your set screw on the knob itself. And that basically completes the installation. I didn't go over the steps of one, two, three, but we will. This, that's the cylinder mounting plate for the rim cylinder, which will ultimately end up occupying the space on the other side of the door right here. Okay. And then those two breakaway screws break away screws. Here are the pin tumbler keys. That is marked 03. 03 is speak, is Baldwin speak for Schlage C. If it says 03, it's not polished brass. It is a Schlage C keyway. Baldwin does other keyways um, by Schlage. I think they do two or three. They do a C, an E. They might do an F or an FG. I guess we can take a look at that as well. I've never seen Baldwin anything but well, I've seen it in an E, never, never anything other than C. No one really thinks about that very much. But you could have a real hybrid of old and new. You could have this nice rim lock on the inside of your door. Then you can run an obloy. Now, if obloy makes rim cylinders, I imagine they do. Or some sort of a high security rim cylinder, uh, like Medeco, um, you know, obviously. Just lots of names of high security stuff. Could, you could have a Brahma may, might make a rim cylinder. I'm not sure. That's a whole nother chapter in the history of locks. Brahma. He is, he is one of the uh, original founders of the movement of locks. He gets his own chapter. Chubb, Hobbs, Brahma. They all get their own chapters. Um, after that, we have the screws. And the last thing uh, I haven't shown you, set screws for the knobs, would be the strike. 
So the strike, this is a rim strike, so the door is going to sit here, okay? This is going to get mortised partially to the frame, but primarily surface mounted. So you obviously have to have some accommodation made for this type of strike. It's a rim lock. Rim locks are surface mounted. The, all of their parts hang off the face of the door, therefore the strike of the rim lock needs to as well. Overall height, about three and three quarter. Overall depth, about an inch and three quarter. The thickness, and that's the part that you're gonna see, really, about 13 sixteenths. Well, the part that's gonna project off the face of the frame is about seven eighths, and then in elevation, you'll see that perspective, okay? Screw hole locations on the on the rabbit of the frame look like it's about two and three eighths There are a couple of screws that will go into the face of it as well You'll want to be real careful when you're drilling those About three inch Okay, so that goes over all of the components that we have here in front of us on this lock And we're going to switch now to the screen view and take a closer look at all of the supporting documentation So let's do so now Okay, let's take a closer look at the lock we are dealing with. That's the rim lock. Um, I don't know what finish they're calling this, this image that they show, but we'll try to detect that. It might be an antique nickel is what it might be. So it's a horizontal rim lock, latch bolt by knob either side, deadbolt by cylinder on the outside or on the inside, uh, or slide bolt. So let's back up. Deadbolt by cylinder, by the rim cylinder on the outside. Unless, of course, you drill a hole through your door and have the bit key go through. Or you can bolt it by the slide bolt. Bolt it and unbolt it, or the bit key on the inside. So be mindful, the only security is when the bolt is manually thrown. The Otherwise, the door would be, when closed, is in the latched position, but it's not secured. The dimensional properties that we've talked about Um, now, back side I did not give you. Um, they say that the back set front to knob hub is three and a half inch. So yeah, that is literally the dimension from the center line of the knob to the edge of the lock. Um, that will be appropriate when installing that mortise lock on the outside. However, I would probably, um, I would treat that as, I wouldn't call it the back set. Uh, and the reason I say that is, even though it is the back set, but it may give us trouble. So what we're dealing with is the term back set. This 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 could all be very common ways that you're going to see this lock installed on a square edge door more likely a beveled edge door and very possibly a rabbited edge door the point of back set is is that it is the dimension from the edge of the door to the center of whatever is being referred to a hole a reinforcement a cylinder um, what's important though to know is that back set is measured from the center line of the door even on a radius edge door on the center line. So if you're going to, if that lock is going to sit onto a beveled edge door and you place it here flush with the edge of the door, three and a half inch from here to here is not the same as three and a half inch when you're measuring to drill that cylinder from here. You're going to come over here because you are biased this way. So be mindful. You don't want to be off when you're drilling it. You've spent a lot of money for a lock. You want to be sure that it's installed correctly. A square edge door, not a big whoop. You're going to get that same dimension. You do, you know, you can see obviously on a rabbited edge door, you're going to need to take into account that rabbit. And that's why back set is always dimensioned from the center of the thickness because it no longer cares how thick your door is. I have a three inch thick door, not a problem. By the way, that bevel is what we call three degree. It's three degree. Uh, is what it is, and the um, and the definition of that is 
three degree is um, is the amount of, of angle on the on the on the planer or the table saw or the saw that's cutting it. That's defined as one eighth in two for every two inches of thickness. That if this was two inch, the di the difference from here to here is one eighth of an inch. Back in the old days, a hundred plus years ago, it was closer to a quarter inch. A much heavier bevel, just way too much. It caused problems for hardware. I'm sure of it. Uh, now let's move here back to the extended description. So what there's, you know, th there is a template included, and they're giving you, um, you know, they're giving you the three and a half inch. Uh, but that's to the edge of the lock body, so it's not. It's, I wouldn't say that's where you're going to drill your hole for your cylinder or your knob. Um, it's very likely going to be okay on one side of the door, but when you measure on the other side of the door, it won't be okay. Uh, you're going to get the 50-30 knobs and 8333 rim cylinder. These locks are designed for use primarily on entrance doors. The 5704 is made of solid brass. The entrance function, which this is what this is, an exclusive feature of our rim locks permits the same size locks throughout the construction. So what they're saying is, if you're doing a project, and I suppose, you know, you could be doing historically accurate work in a new dorm room, a dorm building built in a college that's been around for 250 years. Um, yeah, you're going to be using period correct hardware, and that's where the Baldwins of the world really do a great job because <laughs> they offer it. Um, but what they're saying is the, the size of the lock case itself isn't going to change as you switch from uh, different functions, okay? From keyed function to a just a, a, a passage, let's say. Different finishes. Now, they have more finishes available, and by the time you're seeing this video, that will likely be... Um, this page will be updated. Now, we have some options here that um, are for finish. This will be detailed further, but polished brass and a lifetime finish, which is a PVD finish. If you were to search PVD Papa Victor Delta, you'll find out more about the process of a PVD. 031 is polished brass, solid brass polished brass without the lacquer. 102 is oil rubbed bronze. 150 satin nickel. 190 is the lock we have here, black. 260 is polished chrome. Now, why black? Why did this client order black? Well, Again, the year is 2020. Black's been popular for a couple of years and will probably remain so. I see that the period of uh, fancifulness with a new finish lasts about a decade. However, if you go back in time, 120 years, yeah, black was, was in everyone's catalog. Everyone did a dead Japaned, a black, a dead black Japaned or a bright black Japan to finish. Black was the common color. You saw it all the time. You know, I like to watch really old movies Marx Brothers and before, and while that, while those movies are brilliant, um, you know, I'm looking at the design of the hardware, is 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 also what I'm noticing, hardware from the 1920s. Uh, it's absolutely handed. You could look at this lock and realize, yes, there's no way to make this lock not handed. We have four hands here: left hand and right hand, left hand reverse, right hand reverse. Um, you are only going to order these as left hand or right hand. If you have a right hand reverse door, you're going to order a left hand lock. And a right hand door, you'd order a left hand reverse if that's what you had. The reverses swing out. The non-reverses swing in, uh, but they only make these in lefts or rights. So be mindful. There's a chart that's linked to down below that is right here. Just order it the way that it sh is shown here. Obviously, this door has two keys on it. But think of the term key as the word secure. What side is secure? What side do you have, you know, what side have you? The inside is the secured side, but the key side is the secure side. So wherever that rim cylinder would go is the hand of that door, okay? Now I have some photographs that I've taken of this lock and let's switch now to the screen view and take a closer look at some of those. Inside pictures of the lock body itself. Um, if you were to dig into old lock, um, 
manuals or old lock textbooks, you will find the name of all these. This would be called the Talon in here. Lots of technical terms. This is a design that I've only seen from Baldwin. This is a uniquely Baldwin design. Again, ingenious. Um, I don't know how long this design has existed uh, at Baldwin. I couldn't tell you what a rim lock from Baldwin looked like in 1980. Um, I imagine it's not changed much at all, if at all. Okay, now we have, so what happens up here with the spindle, as you rotate that, these lobes here and here are going to push this post, which is connected to the entire latch assembly. And as you rotate that, it'll drive it back. It's spring biased here to keep that latch in the extended position. Um, what's keeping this controlling lobe in the crotch of the uh, bolt itself, the ward cut in the bolt, is the fact that it's spring biased. And as you move the lever, it will kick that out. It's, ju it's just going to push it this way, allowing that bolt and the plate underneath it, which you see here and back here, to easily move without any obstruction. And as you throw it all the way, this will lock into the other side and keep it in that position. Obviously, the lever is connected right to the handle here. That was the screw that I had to remove in order to get that lever off. That's, uh, this is what it looks like when it's in the thrown position. That's the retracted position. Someone someday might need to study this lock, and that's why the photographs are there. A little close-up view of the talon area when it's in the retracted position. A real nice close-up view. That's where your tailpiece, uh, your rim cylinder tailpiece. What's really interesting about the rim cylinder is that it's a, not a lazy action rim cylinder. A lazy action will allow you to put the key in and turn it 360 degrees or whatever, bring it back to vertical and take it out without automatically withdrawing the action of what you've just done. This preparation in here with these two triangular shapes allows that tailpiece to rotate from here to here to here to here all the way to here so that you can throw it then bring the tailpiece back to the original position and pull the key out locking and unlocking that is called a lazy action that's a lazy action cam another view of it and then again showing you in the partial in the unsecured sort of condition <clears throat> where that lobe is not keeping it locked or unlocked locked <clears throat> pardon me unlocked position in trans in, in travel to the to the locked position. Got another one here. Box. All of the goodies you get. We'll go over all that stuff, and we've gone over most of it already. That's the case. Showing you some up front. Bolt thrown. It's all solid brass. Not all the parts are brass, but the exposed portion, these portions, that's all brass. Uh, you know, I have not given you the bolt projection. Let me do that now. The projection of the bolt. It is 9 sixteenths. It is 11 sixteenths high, and it is about 7 sixteenths thick. Okay. That's the back of the lock body. The knob, uh, I forget what they called that knob, a 5033 maybe? 5030 is the knob. If you look in old catalogs, and I'll point you in that direction by the end of this video, you will see this knob, classic Plymouth style knob. That is the collar for the rim cylinder. It doesn't really belong here because it doesn't go with this. Knob in the inside, exterior uh, rows, that threaded portion. The strike, multiple pictures of it. And then the last set, that's our rim cylinder. The front of the cylinder, that's the keyway, that's a Schlage C keyway. Since it's a rim cylinder, you can put any rim cylinder there that you want. Pin tumbler keys, direct code 254-812-5481. Then our bit key, this is the bit. This piece right here is called the bit. 
You could have had a ward cut here, but then you would have had to have changed the belly. The belly of the lockets of the uh, lever. So if that key changed, this is the belly right here. If you had put a cut into that bottom of that bit, this belly shape would have to change. And it's literally called the belly. But it could have been done. And in terms of that, you can envision how they could create multiple levers and have bit keys with multiple cuts. Um, what would that do that would... It, it, it might momentarily complicate the process of picking the lock open. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an extremely low security lock, so adding additional levers I don't think would really change much. Uh, okay, so that is going to wrap up the pictures. That wraps up our description. Let's take a look now at the um, manufacturer's website for this item. And this is just nice uh, because it's up to date at this very moment. So lots of finishes. Doesn't surprise me, of course, at all. And that finish that I think we had listed there is probably just something out of the catalog from many, many years ago. Um, it's not antique it's no finish really but we're gonna we're gonna update what we have so the description that the factory has here is everything that we still indeed do have um, and installation guide so installation guide is linked to down below specifications document um, that's just we, we have this document and I will show that to you momentarily warranty document that's a statement from the manufacturer obviously but let's kick off first with the um, the cut sheet. So the cut sheet is a one-page document that shows our 5704. Now, admittedly, this is from an older document from the manufacturer. This catalog might date from, well, actually, I can tell you it's from 2011. The fact of the matter is it's not changed very much, if at all. And what they're giving us here, and it looks a little complicated, um, that's Baldwin. When you initially start to learn Baldwin, it seems complicated, but it's just not. If you expose yourself to it long enough, you'll start to understand, oh, this is easy. But there is a learning curve to it. First of all, XXX, that's always the finish. You'll get that from these two columns. That's the bottom line. And these list prices you see here are literally 10 years old at this point of the making of this video. So this is not a guide at all in terms of the cost. You have passage function, you have privacy function, and you have entrance function. You have a dummy version of all of those because the cases are going to be different looking for each function. Then you have your handing. Um, L, right reverse, left reverse. So what they're showing us here is R for right hand, L for left hand, right hand reverse, left hand reverse. Insert where this is the hand of the door. Use Baldwin Lang terminology uh, would be preferred, of course. Um, and then the dummy is, you know, just, it's a right or a left full dummy. You just have to be mindful of following the chart from earlier. If you have a right hand reverse door, a right hand reverse active, you're going to want to have a right hand dummy inactive. Um, and if you stare at that chart and think it through, you'll say, yeah, I see how that is. Um, these are so highly uh, non-symmetrical. Ace, pardon me, pardon me. I thought, I thought as I'm saying it, that's not a word, asymmetrical, that they're utterly handed. Okay. Now, there is a cut sheet here, uh, uh, pardon me, a product brochure here as well. Now, that is about five pages or so, and it's going to be an overview of what the entire lock looks like. Here's a nice line drawing of our entire entrance function. Okay. That mounting plate, the rows with the threaded insert, that little collar, the knob, the spindle, the set screws, it's all there. 
Okay, now they have their own handing chart here as well. Naturally, you're going to see how they determine the handing of this material. It matches everything we talked about. The active door is left hand here. This would be a right hand. So the trick is this. The active is a left hand reverse, but on the dummy, if you did a dummy, they don't offer you the option of ordering a LR or an RR. You're just going to order an L on this. So this would be a left hand reverse. That'll be a left hand. According to, you know, be an LFD is what it would be. A dummy trim rim lock must be used on all pairs of reverse bevel doors. So, why is that the case? Um, well, you're going to need somewhere for that lock to latch into. That's for sure. So they're saying you need a dummy. When you're doing pairs of doors, you're going to need a dummy. Um, now, you don't need a dummy... I think you're gonna probably. I think you're gonna probably need it though, because if you have a pair of doors, and you mount that lock body here, that strike is gonna be like this. Okay, so you're gonna need to have that dummy mounted here for that latch to connect into. If you have a pair of square edge doors, it's no big deal. But rabbited edge, I mean, you're certainly gonna need. You know, you're you're definitely going to need, you know, a dummy and a lock. I should say a lock and a dummy if it's a left hand or if it's a right hand reverse active. Okay. So the nice thing about Baldwin's catalog is, you know, these guys have been in business for decades. They are a historically correct manufacturers of American builders hardware decorative American builders hardware. Their hallmark, their 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 designs go back, you know, to the 19th century for sure. And many classic unique designs to them as well. Uh, okay, let's take a look now at the rest of the product catalog. This is the this is included, this is the cut sheet, but this is the item. And you'll be able to look at all of the different um, shapes, the general different designs uh, of their rim locks, different functions, ones that will take a mortise cylinder. Well, actually, no, that's a rim cylinder. Forgive me. That just has a swivel type cover plate on it. The small case, you have a very large case, our 5704. And you have these beveled styles, and this is this is the more ornate style that I see more commonly in historical work. Not that I see these often, but when I do, it's more colonial like this. Dimensional properties. 5639 with a back-to-back -back plate set. Um, I know that I've seen these in the past. Rim locks with a Plymouth grip style. Uh, Baldwin probably doesn't call this Plymouth, but that's what it looks like. A really big 10 inch case. You know, in the time of the founding fathers, this is what you're going to see. Accessory hardware. The rim lock. Now they have a reverse bevel keeper. Um, why why would you have that? Well, if you have a door that swings out, you're going to install that lock body on the face of the door like this because that door swings out. You're going to need a different strike is just simply the bottom line, and that's how they go about doing that with a outswing strike. Uh, scuff plate. Well, a scuff plate is probably going to be um, used in those installations where you have the latch bolt making premature contact with the casework, the frame, etc. Um, think of it as a piece that would operate like an extended lip strike. Exterior only lock plate. Okay. 
Aha! I knew it! Keyhole covers. There you go. There you go. You don't need that emergency key, but the keyhole cover would be appropriate. And while it probably would not be considered necessarily safe to have a bit key securing your home, <clears throat> um, you might want a rim cylinder at least that's going to give you more security on the outside. But, you know, in Mr. Vanderbilt's situation in his bedroom in a massively, epically ginormous home, that's what he would have had. Well, very likely. Another bit key cover here as well. Replacement bit key, 5755. They're all the same. There's just one bidding for all of their rim locks. That's the collar, the 5758 or spacer that goes on the inside installation under the knob on top of the lock case itself. And there you go. So now the last document really to get into is the installation guide. And let's slide over to that now. Now let's look at the installation instructions. Um, a hallmark of a really great lock manufacturer or hardware manufacturer is giving you a bill of materials because I like to make sure I have everything before I start. Lots of people get down the road so far, they've got holes in the doors and the old lock is thrown off and they've thrown it away and they realize they're missing a $5 part that completely scuttles the entire mission. You've got the lock body, the cylinder back plate, the spindle is a tad, well the spindle um, is loose and that will go through the door. It's not attached to anything, it will end up attached. You've got what they call a spanner here or a spanner wrench. The E is the alignment bushing. The alignment bushing is in with the mounting plate, which is N. F, G, H, and I are the screws. Those are all in the screw package. You've got um, four, you've got six long screws. Four are for the body. And then two are for the strike. The ones that are for the strike are going to be the flathead. The ones for the body will be the oval head screws um, that are there. The length of those screws, about two inch, just long on two inch. No, actually, forgive me, it's two inch. Uh, then you've got two shorter screws, and they will also be for the strike. Uh, they will be for the rabbit end of the strike. Uh, what else? is in here. They show two more screws. I'm not sure what they're for. The G and the I. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two. That's eight screws in that one in that our primary package. The other two, I'm not sure just yet what they're referring to. Um, unless they're referring to the screws for the, ah, this is what it is. Yeah, these are for the, that's for the rim cylinder. The three G's, these eight are in the package. The three G's, oh, the three G's, of course, are for the mounting plate here. And M is that cylinder collar for the L rim cylinder. Mounting plate, the retaining ring that goes on the outside. The uh, brass washer goes on the inside. The rose goes on the outside, the bit key. The keys, which would be the keys for the rim cylinder. Your two knobs, your two set screws, and then there's an Allen wrench, they say. Uh... Nowhere here. I don't know what's what's that all about, but there is no Allen wrench in this package. Not a problem. I'm going to measure it and tell you what size Allen key you will need. If it's here, I'm just missing it. Okay, the Allen wrench that you're going to need. It's going to be a uh, three. Th oh, whoa. Um, eighth of an inch Allen wrench what that's going to be one eighth and that and that set those set screws are for the knobs onto the spindle now um, on the left hand side they're going to show us 
the uh, tools that you need, screwdrivers, hammer, drill, all that stuff. You'll probably need a hammer and chisel as well. A router would be my preferred tool of choice to mortise the keeper in. It's not a strike because the latch, uh, well, I suppose I suppose it's a, a, a strike, but you know, a keeper is more of a referenced term when there's a bolt involved. You know, a, a dead bolt doesn't strike the strike plate, but it's the bolt is held in the keeper, a rectangular bolt, showing you what this is, needs to look like. And there is a template, by the way, as well, which we're going to get to. The breakaway mounting screws are for the rim cylinder. So you're going to figure out where those holes need to be. So we pick this up and look at the installation of the rim cylinder. You know, after you get the, the holes drilled, and again, we're going to go over the template um, as well. Going to get that, you know, the, the holes prepped as, as necessary, the rim cylinder hole. Uh, and we'll look at the template uh, before long here. The hole for the spindle prepped on um, both sides of the door to make accommodation for the rim cylinder tailpiece to come through as shown here on the interior side. Getting the rim cylinder installed to the door first is necessary. That tailpiece will project out. Then you're going to place your body right over that. You probably expect to have to trim that because the underside of the head to the back of the tailpiece itself is, you know, three and three and a half inch for sure. You're not going to need nearly that much room, so you'll have to trim it along with likely cutting the screws down as well. Get that body installed. The rim cylinder is on the outside. Then the rest is all downhill. You're going to put that spindle, the mounting plate, the bushing. That all goes onto the door, and you want to make sure that the spindle is through the door and into the hub of the lock so that you have it in the proper orientation and that when you push the mounting plate and the anti-friction uh, hub over the spindle you're centering it so that it works so that it is completely centered and will allow the knob to rotate and retract back more importantly um, to the proper position, allowing the latch to freely retract out again or to project out again without any friction or bind. So you've got to make sure that that is all really um, straight. And if it's not, it's a problem. It, it needs to be because then your knob won't turn correctly because the spindle is a linear object and it needs to travel through the door into the lock case, through the hub, completely through the lock case, uh, etc. Okay. Your rows will go up next. Your threaded collar will thread down onto the mounting plate. You'll use your spanner wrench to tighten that. Um, and then it's just attaching the knobs down to the spindle, set screws. That's the inside portion. You've got the outside installed. Now the inside's just um, simple and straightforward. That will allow a little bit of movement because that, you know, that spacer that's there that's not attached to the lock body at all except just being held on by the set screw into the base of the knob. Now mortising your jam for the strike, that's pretty simple and straightforward. When they present it to you in this sort of view, you can see exactly what it is supposed to look like. You know, making some sort of accommodation to your casing is going to be the important part. Um, you're going to have to chisel, router, notch, things of that nature. The one dimension I did not give you was the thickness of the lip. Um, on the rabbit of the frame, which is 0 0.097, and what I'm referring to is the thickness of this. I would be looking to mortise that. And then a really elegant, completed view, albeit out of scale. That's what that looks like. Install the keeper. Now you're done. What height should you put it at? Well, um, it's not handicap compliant, so you don't need to obligate yourself uh, with putting it anywhere in particular. Um, you know, operating trim is anywhere between 34 and 48 inch. If it's residential, 36 inch from the floor would be very typical. If it's more commercial, which this really wouldn't be commercial, although you could install them in a commercial application that would be closer to 40 inch, maybe just a hair heavy on that, I would audit the rest of the doors in the space and follow along. 
I find 36 a little f short to the floor, but that's typical for residential. The next document to look at will be the template. And I have that document pulled up that we can look at it. Um, it is a bit, it's too, it's too wide to be scanned all on one page. So I'm gonna rotate this. Uh, and the key with that is to look at it as elegantly as possible. Let's get it rotated around. And it has admittedly a bit on the left and right cut off. There are three pages in this scanned template. The third page is as much as I can fit on here. And the what's missing on the right and the left side is going to be, of course, um, on the first two pages. But nonetheless, what's most important, again, is that it's showing us that three and a half inch dimension from the edge of the lock body. They're giving us tear off and line up with edge of jam. So they're leaving you a very small margin of a sixteenth of an inch here. You don't want it to be excessive, um, more than an eighth of an inch. These latch bolts, the latch itself, uh, I had told you earlier that the bolt projects about 9 sixteenths. The latch projects half of an inch. So you don't want to have that gap too excessive because you've only got a half inch latch throw um, on the latch body itself. So they're referencing the center line of the lock here. They're referencing a three and a half inch dimension from the edge of the lock. You're going to margin that against your jam uh, or against the edge of the door. They've got a sixteenth of an inch clearance built into this. I don't see any dimension that's going to be inherently based on the sixteenth of an inch dimension. So, you know, if that's an eighth of an inch, it's not going to be a problem or a botheration, in my opinion. You're going to be dealing most likely with a door that already exists. So you're not going to have necessarily the um, option to, um, you know, call that out. If you're doing a new new construction, it's going to be you're not going to you're not going to tell them that you want a sixteenth of an inch edge there. It'll be three thirty seconds at a minimum, eighth of an inch if it's a square edge door. So where where to drill holes? Well, you've got your lock center line, and you've got reference points off of that. Um, somewhere you do. Somewhere you must. Um, right. Okay, so they're saying the center line of the lock and the center line of the strike are two and seven eighths. Okay. You're going to divide that by two inch and um, seven sixteenths to get to this hole, to get to this hole, etc. Then from there, you can get everywhere else on the paperwork, apparently. Um, you know, I would have referenced it all off the center line myself. Line up with horizontal line marked on door. Horizontal line of knob, sure. So you're going to have your rim cylinder prep, uh, which should be an inch and a quarter. No, they want inch and five sixteenths. For the rim cylinder. Um, and that will go through the door. You've got that location. You've got your knob location, which is inch and seven eighths vertically. If you're going to, uh, well, you'll certainly be, if you're going to be making a bit keyhole on the exterior, three quarter inch, three eighths diameter hole, quarter inch deep. Um, Not really sure what they're referring to on that. Oh, I know why. Forgive me, because the post of the key, the 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 end of the key, will project into the face of the door. Your bit key has a longer nose on it. That's why it, that's why that has to be there. Otherwise, your key won't fit in the lock all the way. They want to counter board hole five eighths deep eighth of an inch and drill half inch all the way through the door. 
I'm gonna counter board counter board hole. That is because you have some extra hardware on the back there, the back of the lock, where the hub is. That's why you're gonna counter bore that. You're gonna drill a half inch hole through the door, but then they want a five eighths hole, one eighth of an inch deep on top of that. Your four holes for the screws are here. Um, it appears as if they are showing that strike to be mortised flush. We measured that dimension at about 96 thousandths or 332nd of an inch. Okay. It's easy stuff. I mean, locate a reference point. You know, where do you want that knob to be? Where would you want the key to be? Audit the other doors that exist or make your own dimension. If it was going to be me, I'd probably put it closer to 38 inch. Um, I would likely want my, you know, my knob, if I put my knob at 36, my, my, um, my key is going to be well below that. So I might be looking to get, you know, this stuff at 36. This is going to be closer to 38, be a better, um, balance, I think, but completely subjective, wherever you like it. And that's the template. And that's linked to here down below as well. Okay, moving to the end here, this is a link below this video to the manufacturer's page that I clicked on right here. And that will allow you to pull up not only all of the Baldwin products that we sell, but also a link to the manufacturer's website, which is here, as well as a link to the current product catalog. There are prior versions of the product catalog. I think the Baldwin estate book that I was looking in was here. So it's an older document, but I like the older document because I'm, I'm first of all, I'm familiar with it, and um, I believe it to be a very comprehensive source of what was made at that time, and not much has changed in the world of estates locks, meaning uh, the trims that you could get 10 years ago or 30 years ago, those are probably all still available. Not all of them, because some of their crystal knobs, I believe, are discontinued. Uh, but the designs that Baldwin uh, puts out into the marketplace are so timeless because they've existed for decades and a century plus that you're going to continue to see this stuff. These beautiful grip handles. They're just, they're gorgeous. The knobs, the lever trims will come after this. I, th I think. I've gone too far. It's above the grip handles. Yeah, all of our knob trim. That was a 5033 knob, I believe it was. Or a 5030. Yeah, there it is. You can do that 5030, and as a result, you can inherently do any knob on there that you practically want. The only trouble is you've got that rim cylinder sitting below it. Not that that should be an issue, because it won't. Um, and I don't see a knob that would cause a problem with that. You simply might want a knob that's more compatible with your design look. It's a beautiful knob. They all are. All right, let's wrap up this video on camera. In conclusion, it's a great um, pleasure to review this lock from a perspective of um, having a little bit of knowledge of the history of this type of lock and construction. Um, some people might look at it and say, yeah, I need one of them old time locks. Yeah, this is really old time. Uh, nice quality fit and finish. Now, why? It's unlikely that you're going to buy a Baldwin rim lock. It's unlikely that anyone's going to buy a Baldwin rim lock. Um, it would be a special circumstance that you would. But why would you buy Baldwin? That's the bigger question. The reason you would is because they're exceptional people at Baldwin. And I mean that uh, from the perspective of calling them with a technical question. Um, I have an understanding of certain things in locksmithing. And the people that I speak to there are really, really very well trained on their product line. Very well. In fact, every single time that I've called there, and it's not been a lot, but over the years and decades, it's been, it's been a few times. I get someone on the phone. It's usually, I usually, half the time I don't get past the first person um, that I talk to. But their command over the knowledge, their commanding knowledge over their product line is superb. I had a client call with a mortise lock from about the late 1970s. A spring broke because springs will crystallize, they will break. That's what causes $500 locks to stop working, a $1 spring, typical. 
um, explain to the clients that I need two new locks. Why do you need two new locks? A spring broke. Stop. Let's try to replace the spring. Now, I don't think we're going to be able to do it. This lock's from 1977. Well, hold on. You said it was Baldwin. Now, I know some people at Baldwin. Let's, let's just do some research. Got the client's contact information. He's ready to go. He needs locks, $700 each. He needs two of them. They got to ship tomorrow. Call Baldwin. Transfers, transfers me to tech support. Explain to the client the function that I have. I've got pictures. A spring broke. I'm describing which spring I need. He says, does it have a blue case? I says, yes, it does. What year did you say? 1977. He's like, yeah, I was in the back making those locks in 1977. The bottom line is the gentleman knew exactly the spring that I needed. Exactly. Mailed two of them to the client at no charge. Okay. Now, I'm an advocate of selling locks, because that's what we do. We're lock salesmen. But I'm an advocate of solving problems. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for as much as, uh, you know, if you can fix a lock, you fix a lock, is, is the lesson that a person learns over time. The point is, is that Baldwin creates that environment by which that can be done, and they do it every single time that I speak to them. And what's really amazing is that they're not just Baldwin hardware. They're owned by someone else. And they have sister companies that I wouldn't historically think about when I think of Baldwin, but they've maintained that excellence. And it's why I would consider that you use them. There are other companies who make uh, residential hardware, lots of them. You've got your Schlegs, your Westlocks, your Quicksets, whoever is down here. And Schlage does a great job. They all do. You've got your MTech and Omnias in terms of cost. you got your Baldwin here and then your boutique people above that. Baldwin is a great confluence of value and quality and tech support. You deal with some of those lower end stuff, you can't get a spring. You can't get someone on the phone, although Quicksets pretty good, who happens to be a sister company to Baldwin. You, uh, very good, in fact. You can't get parts. I don't think that I've ever gotten a replacement spring for an MTech mortise lock. Maybe it's possible, but it's, you know, I've not been able to. Now, if you're building a 10,000 square foot house and the cost difference between an Omnia or MTech and Baldwin, it's gonna be huge. There's no doubt, but in my opinion, the caliber of the material is different as well. That's just how I feel about it, especially when you calculate that long-term cost of ownership. When you've got a company like Baldwin who's been doing it very, very good for decades, it's hard to say no to them. That's the bottom line. Any questions on the 5704 Rimlock or any other Baldwin product, please feel free to reach out to us. And thank you. Epilogue. I'd like to show you where you might be able to do further research if you're interested in this type of 18th century construction that you would see, 19th century construction most definitely. So in no particular order, you could learn more about the warded lock, the lever tumbler lock. Uh, those each successively gave way to the predominance of the pin tumbler lock, which is what we primarily use um, it, it, we certainly use it every day, but it's primarily the lock technology that is used by everyone all the time. Even a tubular key, that round key with the nib on it that you'd see in a vending machine or in a coin-operated laundry mat type facility, those are pin tumblers in there as well. It's just in a radial sort of fashion. So, first of all, in our website, we have the link to the manufacturer's page. Because Yale and Corbin Russwin, uh, pardon me, because Yale and PF Corbin and Sargent as well, most definitely, are lock manufacturers that go back to basically the second half of the 19th century, there are several examples uh, from those lock companies. Well, for Yale, we have some old catalogs. I have catalogs from 1880 to 1937 uh, and from a historical perspective. So let's, let's open up the catalog from 1880. And as that loads, and Yale is the, a good example because it was indeed Yale, Linus Yale Jr., as I had mentioned earlier, who patented the modern pin tumbler cylinder. And a search online will certainly be able to find easily this patent. Uh, 
this is not real. This is definitely not the one I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, definitely not. It's a little bit too uh, old, uh, too late, so to speak. But the concept of these tumblers was popularized by Linus Yale Jr. And Linus Yale Sr., he was a lock maker as well, just focused on the banking security. So these pin tumblers here, okay? So we go to Yale because they've been in the game since the mid-19th century. It's not hard to look up a history of Linus Yale Jr. So as we're looking at a 1880 catalog, literally um, the year Garfield was elected, okay? <laughs> I think he was the 20th president. Uh, so this goes back. Um, you're going to find that Yale had a marketing effort going on simultaneously, which was their Yale lock, the pin tumbler lock. This was a flat key, no corrugations to it, a very early example of the pin tumbler uh, technology. But at the same time, they were making the standard locks. And they were certainly looking to market as... Oh, you want the regular one? Well, you go over here and wait in this really long line. You want the standard lock. If you want the newest technology, you want the Yale lock. And there is uh, a substantial, outrageous substantial leap forward in capability of this platform over this platform in the sense of the amount of potential different keys that you could have in a master keyed environment. And while that may not have mattered to the average person in 1880. The industrialization of the United States in the Northeast was, you know, well on its way, meaning buildings and buildings have doors and companies have many buildings, the railroad magnets, transportation magnets, um, you know, banking, uh, you know, and then the just, you know, manufacturing large facilities would substantially would have benefited by being able to have the segregation of their, I suppose it's a poor term for the time, um, but the segregation of doors based on rights and privileges over a key. The standard or bit key uh, does not, it really falls flat in that department. So as we scroll through this catalog where they offer standard locks as well as their the modern pin tumbler lock, we're going to scroll through and as we do, we're going to scroll past the pin tumbler locks. And because this catalog is a bit sticky, I'll pause the video. And it's just because it's such a large file. Um, you'll notice that there are no corrugations in the face of the keyway. Well, the proper term for that is that it's uh, a, a key that would have multiple angles like this would be called paracentric meaning the center line crosses the vertical axis. The, this 1880 technology did not feature that. Well, they soon found that any instrument would be very easy at just lifting the pins, so they came up with the paracentric keyway, and Yale definitely calls their primary keyway the para, P-A-R-A, -A, short for paracentric. And as we continue to scroll through, that is a double-bitted um, key that's there and we'll have a very ingenious system of levers on the inside of the lock but as we get to the standard locks Japan black Japan black that's what that means ebony so you know <laughs> ebony's down here in the cheapest column uh, you know as I suspected it would be so Let's get to where we can look at the inside of a standard lock, so to speak. So these are mortise locks, mortise lock versions of this type of construction. And obviously they, you know, rim locks as well. Now here is a prime example of a bit lock, uh, of a bit key lock that has lever tumblers. So this is the technology that proceeded, that came after the warded lock. 
So that bit key, what the cut says I had attempted to explain earlier, when those are lifted, the depth of that cut on the bit will serve to force the lever tumblers into alignment such that the fence can enter the gates. And you'll see that there, is, there are these different steps. The bellies on all of these levers are the same belly. That wasn't always the case, but they found it easier to pick those locks open when they had different, when you could visually uh, inspect the lock through the keyhole and notice the different bellies. And that would give an indication as to uh, how far you had to lift the lever. Well, they made all the bellies the same and they changed where the, the double-gated cutout would be in the lever tumbler itself to, to allow the fence to pass through. So the depth of the cuts on the bit, when that's rotated up, will lift that, these lever tumblers, to different to differing degrees of lift, allowing that right there, that post is called the fence. That fence is attached to the entire back plate back here, which is the bolt itself. When you when that fence and that bolt are on the same piece of material, just like our Baldwin lock. So this catalog's from 1880, and this technology is 150 years past the warded lock. At, at least 200 years past. There may have been a mention of it. You know, I, I, I've forgotten so much of what I've read, like I, I would imagine many of us have, but um, I mean, it's literally mid-17th century. So anyway, the this bit key that we have is really no different in the sense that it the bit forces a makes contact with something inside the lock that removes the blockage and the key lifts the levers which aligns these gates that's what this right here is this open area is called the gate and um, allows the fence to pass that post is called the fence what's ingenious about this naturally is that the bolt can't be pushed in and when it's over here, when the bolt's been retracted, and in this part of the uh, H, so to speak, it can't be moved out, like we had talked about earlier. Okay. And of course, we can scroll through further and find several additional examples of this lock. On the Yale page, I had mentioned all of these catalogs. I had mentioned a test I was taking, and there was one question that was, well, there were many questions that were boggling my mind. Well, I found the answer clearly in the 1937 catalog. If you go back to manufacturers and you go to um, Sargent, you will find old catalogs as well. Here's one from 1877. And, you know, I'm just... As you can probably tell, I'm awestruck. You know, Rutherford Hayes was the president when this catalog was was published. As we scroll through, what you'll note if you look through these catalogs is these lock names that are alive today that you know about as lock, door closer, and exit device manufacturers. Well, back then, they made everything for the home. You know, if you wanted your window hardware and your door locks and your you know, others, builders, hardware, all from the same manufacturer you could. And the reason that you probably would want that is because the finishes would all match because this was a half of a century before the standardization of finish codes. So every manufacturer had their own list of really strange finish codes that, you know, would be pretty tough. Now, you know, in 1887, when we have this sergeant lock here, this bit, this, this, is, this is literally... The rim lock, this is what we have, what we're dealing with. So looking at this construction, it's somewhat concealed, but it appears as if this is our Baldwin lock in reverse, where the bolt assembly is on top. And right here, I would guess, is when the bit key, and this is the case ward, I had met, said earlier, that's the case ward. When the bit key goes in and turns, it lifts this. I would imagine this fence is connected to that. That will go vertical. In the talon is where the bit will push the bolt forward, allowing that lever here to then rest behind this, because this position will be moved from here to here. It's just my guess. Um, it's a bit deceiving that this does not have an angled prep to the back side of it. I would expect that it would. But, you know, it probably works like that. 
um, would would be would be my my guess. You know, you've got your spindle all the way through. That's always going to work. That's always going to activate the lock and uh, retract the latch. Uh, this is clearly a hold a um, a privacy feature here, where you can hit that trigger and it's going to come down and prevent someone from coming in. Maybe it's a bathroom. It's a privacy. Uh, why you know why you would need a bolt on that? Well. You know, you're just preventing someone with a key from coming in. This is definitely what you're doing, uh, because I can retract the bolt with the key from either side, but not not when this trigger has come down. Okay. Um, this is a bit key. You can see in the bottom they don't need any ward cuts, even though our Baldwin lock has ward cuts. But it would need these ward cuts on the side because it has these concentric ward cuts here. Okay. So without looking for it, we can see that this concept has existed for at this point 150 years and, and who knows how long this kind of design so very fascinating now also if you wanted to go very deep into the woods on these locks search for Mossman lock m-o-s-s-m-a-n Mossman lock you'll find the Mossman lock collection in the general society of mechanics and tradesmen of the city of New York Okay. Um, this I had spoken about this earlier. The Mossman Lock Collection is astounding. I don't I don't know that there's a another collection. Um, well, I know that there is another collection of locks um, in the United States, um, in Connecticut, that. I've not been to, yeah, the Lock Museum of America, and the curator is the son of a very, very well-known individual in the history of, you know, late 20th century lock development, um, Lock Museum of America. So this one I've not been to, but it's going to have beautiful examples of the history of locks. The Mossman Lock Collection is wholly different in the sense that it has pieces that are steps in the evolutionary um, development of, of lock sets. And I will show you a couple, example, a couple of examples of that under the Corbin Ruswin page in my site. There's an article that I wrote about the Master Ring, which is an 1890, basically, uh, piece of technology that Corbin Ruswin popularized. And after having visited, I took I have a couple of pictures worth seeing. Okay, there's that link that I had just shown. And that's what the entire collection looks like. This is a second floor balcony type of perspective. It's not nearly as big as this distorted picture makes it look, but lots of locks here. And the Hobbs paratropic lock is mentioned. That's A.C. Hobbs, the Han Solo of his day. Beautiful workmanship. That lock would work for centuries. The Brahma lock I had also mentioned. A radial key in its design. I have a Brahma cylinder. I have a, I have a Chubb detector lock as well. Uh, then there's the changeable bit key, which is a neat uh, type of lock because you can kind of rekey it yourself. So the smart key technology that exists today 
what you'll find is when you dig deeper into the world of locks, there are just nothing other than ideas that are rehashed because you could easily uh, remove a screw, basically, and reorganize these bits, these, these bits, and then restack the levers, and you have a brand new combinated lock. This is a barrel key I had mentioned earlier. There's a hollow, uh, this, this, the tip of this key is hollow and goes over this post. Um, then there is also a book called The Lore of the Lock, which is here, and it discusses the Mossman collection. And you can pick this book up on, online. Um, it's not difficult to come across, okay? I hope that this additional uh, amount of interest, uh, amount of video has interested you to search and dig deeper. Do you run into these locks ever? No, of course not. The reason they're important is because they're a huge part of the evolution of locksmithing and the foundation of locks that we use today. Thank you. Again, thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this video, please click thumbs up. Please subscribe and maybe even send the video to someone that you know. Thank you.